Good morning, everyone. <laughs> so excited that we're having a sustainability summit here on campus at Canador. This is a dream come true for me. So I'm really excited as well as you to hear what's going on uh, on campus and coming up. So very excited. Um, so thank you to Jesse and the students and everyone working behind the scenes here. It's exciting to see uh, something new happening here too, this way. And hopefully we'll have lots of more of these in the future. Get some students here on stage too. Um, I'm presenting on water movement, which Jesse uh, spoke about briefly there. And I'm also featuring a couple other people. Oh, that's an interesting Ian Jose. I really want to <laughs> accentuate that. <laughs> But uh, Water Movement, the, the non nonprofit, was uh, founded by Bitta Malekian, and so we'll introduce you to her, and she'll speak about, um, about the movement specifically towards the end of the presentation. And Jose Street is a grad that uh, introduced me to this movement, so. Let's move forward, here we go. So, um, so some things we'll be addressing today, I'll start just talking about what I teach and, and what operators are and, and learn a little bit more about how I'm preparing the next generation to help with uh, water treatment in Ontario um, or wastewater. And some of the different trainings that are available. Um, we'll have a focus on, on First Nations, the crisis with, with water and some of the things that are being done, including water movement. So let's jump right in, dive right in. Um, so, <laughs> For water operators, um, the main focus, a lot of people are interested in um, the first two, which is drinking water certification and um, wastewater cer certification, depending on what you prefer, if you really like biology, and because like, the wastewater treatment is a biological process, so you're controlling populations of microbes, which is pretty cool. Um, there's four categories in the first two, <laughs> not, the, not three and four. Um, you can work in the treatment plant or you can work outside of the plant. D we call it distribution because we need to distribute the drinking water to the community. And on the flip side, wastewater, you can work in the plant or you can work in the infrastructure that distributes or collects the sewage to the central um, pollution control facility. So those are the, the ones I focus on in, in my course. I teach. Um, environmental technology in our fourth semester of our environmental technician program. We have a, a third year now as well with a four, four month placement, which is really good for the students. And uh, another course I teach is applied sustainable energy solutions. So I could really relate to some of the other content being shown here. Um, other, uh, some of our students often, there's usually a few of them every year that work in the Ontario park system and they have small systems that need to, you know, supply the, the potable water to the, uh, to the campers. So there is a, a special certification you could do for small systems. And water quality analysts, um, not really operators, but if you work in a lab, um, you, could, you can gain this certification. We're hoping to maybe in the future add it as a certification or a, um, a micro-credential. And we are lucky, in 2007, the opportunity came up. The ministry was looking for opportunities to train more people into the water field to promote it. And so they were asking colleges to offer uh, the entry-level drinking water course as part of their programming. So the, um, the dean and the, the college at the time jumped right on board, including our coordinator, uh, Samantha Hornell. And so we started entering the, doing this course as part of our programming. And it's worked into the, the entire two-year program, but the, the core course is done in, in the classroom with me. So it's like a trade, a red seal trade, really, becoming a water operator, like becoming a plumber, an electrician. Actually, it's good if you know how to do both of those if you're gonna be an operator. Um, but to start out, you need to write an OIT exam. We used to operate or in training. We used to offer this in-house, but now it's, it's run by um, the certification office, Ontario Water Wastewater Certification Office. And so you can go there to find exams and register. So I help the students towards that process, but that's the first step. If you wanna work in the water trade, you need one year experience as an OIT before you can go ahead and write your class one and start your way up the progression. 
So in order to write the class one exam or get an extension on trying to get your one year experience, you need the entry level course, which is what we offer here in our programming. So it's pretty exciting when I see, you know, how many students, how many in this group you know, are interested in entering the water trade and, you know, out of 25 or 30 or 40, I'll get, you know, 10 hands. So, so it's pretty exciting. It's a really important field. It's always evolving. It's always changing, really dynamic. There's always new things we're putting in our water. That's <laughs> the new fear <laughs> that we need to regulate and control. And uh, so there's lots going on. What else did I Oh, I have it right here. I don't have to look over there. <laughs> All right, just technology. So Walkerton is interesting. I, I just took a student's not this group, but another group of students down to Walkerton, as I do every spring. We can take 12 students down and, and get some real professional development on site at the Walkerton Clean Water Center. But it's interesting because the Walkerton crisis happened in the year 2000, and now my students are born after that year, <laughs> right? So, so they don't they don't know about it. So it's really important for people to understand that you know that this happened. That you know it should have happened like 20 years before it did, but the conditions just weren't right for it. And so we had the tragedy, everyone in the town got sick, and some people are still on dialysis to this day from, from that tragedy, and seven people died. So there was a, a full, full on inquiry that was put out there, and uh, one of the requirements was certification. A lot of people that run plants aren't certified, so this is what they're trying to change. So that, that wasn't repeated. Um, Walkerton Clean Water Center, great resource to this day. They have a, a hotline, so like if you're starting an Airbnb and you, you know, you're wondering about the water or your business or your a new facility, you can call the helpline and they'll help you out with technical support for, for what you need. They do on-site testing, so they'll actually a pi take a pilot treatment plant and drive it up in a truck up to the community and put their water through it and try and figure things out. Um, or do it um, on, on uh, remotely. So they'll basically send a water truck, grab a whole bunch of their water supply, bring it down to Walkerton, put it into their water tank, and run it through different processes. And they do lots of research and, and everything. So it's a great center and a great resource. So it's kind of nice to see that a good opportunity came out of that, uh, that tragedy. Um, zoning in, particularly on, on First Nations, we'll, we'll be talking about the crisis a little bit more and just to, to be aware that there are quite a few training opportunities available to try and get us out of this, um, this hump here or over the hump. Um, the entry level course that I offer is um, usually it's delivered as a, a week long course with a self study module and it's you know three grand or something plus expenses. So it's quite expensive. So the government is actually right now um, offering it free to First Nations operators, so they'll they'll fly them down or and uh, accommodate them food, pay for the tuition, everything, get them certified. So there are opportunities available by connecting with the Aborig Aboriginal Water and Wastewater Association of Ontario, or the the one I mentioned, the OWWCO, this other organization, the First Nations Technical Services Corporation. They offer specific programming for. First Nations operators that are already in the biz um, with their circuit trade uh, circuit rider program. So lots of um, opportunities. Actually, the Water Wastewater Association of Ontario, the Aboriginal, was there pre uh, Walkerton. So I kind of understand that this was a problem before. The earliest research I could find was the uh, actually the federal NDP government when they got in, um, and they're like, "What do we do?" Um, no. Um, <laughs> They, um, you know, gave us the Environmental Bill of Rights, which is like huge, and also they made a commitment to end the boil water advisory. So I did see a commitment back then. So it has been something we've been working on, and it's nice to see a, a new focus on that. So I was hoping that uh, our student Jose Street could be here. She is, was the grad of the first cohort of the third year program when we brought it back a few years ago. Um, she actually got called away, and um, she's working on her passion as to um, to actually help First Nations have clean water, drinking water. She came to me in her second year, just really passionate about this, and and it was it was great because that passion led led her to 
landing a really great placement with a past grad of ours. So, you know, we've been running since the 70s, the Environmental Technician Program, and so we've got this great resource that all of our grads that go on <laughs> become operators or business owners or end up in, in these different places. And uh, so Jamie Levine, who's Environmental Coordinator for the Assembly of First Nations, took on Jose and mentored her for her placement. And it was in that placement that Jose met Bitta Malekian, who's the founder of Water Movement, and got involved with that process. So we'll learn a bit more about Water Movement. But Jose was featured in a couple of the videos on their, on their website. So shortly I'll play this, uh, this video. I'll just cue the team to, uh, to launch it in a sec. But um, she's, so her passion is to be in the north, helping communities. She is doing that right now, but flood mitigation and working forest fires. So that's where she is uh, today. Okay. Right, so she introduced, then she introduced me to water movement. So I got involved, made some videos as well, and I've been promoting it like her. Um, it's a great movement, and, and you'll hear more about it and how it's helping to, uh, to target the water crisis in, in Ontario and across the country. Hopefully someone was watching. <laughs> okay. Okay. Do you want to jump in there? Oh. Are you able to switch? Sorry, are you able to switch? There Mother we go. Earth takes care of us by providing clean water, just as mothers care for a child within her womb. And that's kind of the teaching that had started with women being um, water carriers and water keepers. Um, women also have a moon cycle where every month we are reminded of the connection with Nokomis Moon and how the moon impacts um, water tides and water cycles. So this is a sacred time where I personally take the time. Um, I go down to water, uh, to a water source, usually to a um, trout lake, and I give thanks to the water. And I usually give her berries, or when I don't have berries at the time, um, I usually just dip my feet in and sing or talk or um, have that connection with her and the water spirit. And that's just how it fits into my life. It can be different for some other women. That's just how I had seen how I'm supposed to give thanks. Because um, there's not too much that I can do at this point in my life. I'm still working on my career. With the events that had happened within the past couple of generation, I find that the connection to the land um, has been severely severed and our traditional roles as water keepers were not being honored and that is where we had seen a lot of the complications come in. Women weren't having their traditional roles in the communities and they weren't being honored or respected um, and so like when it comes to women as water keepers it is just in our roots, it's in our blood. There's, there's no, there's no other way to say it. And um, yeah, there's a, there's a really popular saying within the community, um, called says water is life, and that doesn't ring. That that, not doesn't ring. <laughs> it rings very true. <laughs> um, the cultural significance to us is not limited to the daily use and what we can get out of water, but it's about reciprocity and it's about respect. It's about treating it water like uh, water like a human being, like you would yourself. So that's where the women in water come in because a lot of times the men don't have that connection. They don't have that spiritual um, pushing, the nurturing, the mothering that comes with women and, and two-spirited people even. And uh, that's, where, that's where we fit in. That's where water needs to go in the industry. It needs to go back to the basics. You know, I, I always see a lot of these um, technologies and how technology can kind of like bring us out of it, but like we've been taking care of Mother Earth and she's been taking care of us for thousands of years. Like there's no technology, we have the answers. There's no, there's no way, way to technology out of it. There, we need to go back to our roots and, and a lot of people are forgetting that right now. Jose. <laughs> so the next set of slides is I'm just going to introduce a little bit of a, a background. Like we have a lot of like-minded people here, and I'm sure you're aware 
have a lot of going on in the background, but just so we're all on the same page, we can, I'm gonna um, just go over a little bit of content. I've got some audience participation in here too, so if you have a, a device, I'll give you a prompt for uh, logging in so I can give, get some feedback from you as well. So first of all, of course, this is an ever-changing thing about our long-term drinking water advisories in Canada. There are also short-term advisories. There's some of those going on as well, but long-term just means it's, it's been an issue for more than a year. Um, so we can see there has been progress. Um, I think there were 100 or so removed within um, 2015 to 2020, but there's always new ones popping up too. So still ongoing, so there's still some work to do in these areas. And you think, you know, Canada, we've got all this fresh water, right? Like they say that over 70% of all the lakes in the world by number are in Ontario and Quebec alone. So we've got lots of water. So what's going on, right? Um, it's a bit of a, you know, well, I think it's, it's known globally that, that this is an issue. So hopefully we'll be able to change that. So the three terms that you'll hear, there actually are different types of advisories. So the boil water is basically looking at the, the bugs in our water, the viruses, the bacteria. Um, those things can be you know, sterilized or inactivated in just one minute of boiling. So, so that's the easiest kind of one to deal with. Um, do not consume advisories are more if we're talking about other toxic substances or things that could uh, harm you if they're ingested. So no amount of boiling is gonna you know, change the content of some heavy metal like uranium or arsenic in your water, right? So, so that's when we don't make sure that you can bathe in it, you know, but not the really young or the, the elderly um, because their skin is a little bit more susceptible to, um, to penetration and such, so. But do not, do not use at all is if you know, the toxin is so great that even contact with the skin can have a negative effect, then we can't do that, so. So those are the three types of advisories that you, that you may hear about. And just thinking about you know, being in, in a community that's on a boil water advisory and thinking about that list of, of stuff that every day that you're doing that you need to boil the water first and then let it cool <laughs> to the right temperature to even make ice or brush your teeth or make infant formula. Of course, uh, you, know, you wouldn't want to be uh, really bathing a baby even in some of the even a boil water advisory because they are so sensitive to that skin. So you can see that we'd have lots of, um, lots of potential impacts and inconveniences. You know, we kind of take for granted that we can just go somewhere, turn on the water fountain, turn on the tap, right? It's, it's crazy to think that in our country we have places where that's not so. So here's the, the first little prompt there. Um, if, you, if you go to that website, even, I don't even think you need the www, just slido.com, and it'll actually ask you for a code. And so if you punch in that code, um, it'll open up a prompt so that you could actually type in a comment. So I'll keep moving here as I, as I uh, throw that up. Um, so. So the first question to think about is like, what's, what's causing these well, um, drinking water advisories? What's, what's triggering those? Um, so maybe you can think, might think of a reason why that could be, um, or maybe you've experienced a boil water advisory in a, in, a, in a situation that you could report on what was that caused that, uh, caused that issue. So, no, so I've got the app open on my phone, so it's, people type in, I should be able to see some comments, but new tech, right? Let's see if it works, if not. <laughs> okay, yeah, I see some coming in. So pharmaceuticals and water supply, you know, things that we flush down the toilet, you know, can have other impacts. Lack of government relate, uh, regulations, pesticides, pollutants, Lack of infrastructure. So yeah, so we've got some good brainstorming coming in here. This is from you, our, our educated and, and brilliant audience here. So, um, so the list, um, I've got some other ones to add here. Um, water line breaks, that's underground. You know, excavation can be hard. Think about spring and frost and heaving and 
you know, we have that issue here. Like, I don't know how many line breaks you get in Northern Ontario, even into April and May, because that ground is frozen so deep, right? It's causing those issues. Um, equipment failure, equipment breaks down. You need to get it from somewhere. Do you have money to order it? How long is it gonna take with the supply chain, plus the pandemic, right? Um, poor filtration or disinfection, which is adding chemical to kill, kill bugs. No trained operator to run the system or trained to test the water. So um, there's lots, all these factors are, are kind of accounting for things, but um, over 80% of the failures are, are due to equipment and uh, processes failing within the plant, even if it's up and running, you know, things happen. If you've got only one, one operator up there too, you know, it's kind of hard to manage all of that. But I was kind of giving some examples uh, in First Nations, but I kind of jumped the gun on the next question is like, well, why are most of the, why are a majority of the boil water advisories in First Nation communities and not just in other communities across the country? So can you think of what additional barriers that a, a First Nations community may have when dealing with these issues? Maybe neighboring, neighboring factories that are causing some emissions, factories, just northern climate circulation, right? Everything kind of goes north. Um, lack of training, infrastructure, shipping accidents. Yeah, you think about um, the water, is thinking about um, that one slide that our, our dietitian was telling us about, uh, you know, how much money for rent and you know, different things for funding. Well, imagine being in a community, a family of four, for a month, we'll be spending about five to six hundred dollars for bottled water, in order to have drinking water. So there's another uh, big impact. Oops, I lost it. Lack of funding, remoteness, oversight. <laughs> yeah, very good. Thank you <laughs> for helping out. You guys are aware. I know this, <laughs> so we're going to start talking about what we can do about it. Um, so these are some of the specific issues for First Nation communities. Um, operator training, I did mention earlier, like I think about North Bay, the wastewater facility in North Bay on Lake Nipissing is quite old um, and things break down, right? We, we actually have three full-time millwrights that work just, at, just in the North Bay facilities, right? And this is a pretty, uh, you know, newer infrastructure. So think about one operator up north you know, you kind of need to be a jack of all trades, right? Electrician, maybe a plumber, uh, millwright, you know, being able to, to make things, right? Because you need to innovate if you can't get parts. Um, the lead time for getting parts, um, being a, able to troubleshoot that we think of, you know, remote, you know, we can help them remotely, you know, Skype in or Zoom in and help them out. But, but remembering too that um, high-speed internet is kind of, um, a lacking infrastructure piece up in the north as well, so it's harder to support than we might think. Retention of operators, right? Why why would you stay in your community and and make less money when you can go to a, a city and make more money, right? So we've got that that brain drain. There's a lot of other cultural issues that are embedded in there. I've heard heard from students. Okay, bad timing for a phone call. Okay. <laughs> Okay, but thinking of, a, of an example, uh, you might have heard of Lytton, uh, BC, which uh, tragically was wiped out by a forest fire um, a couple summers ago. But one of the board members for water movement, uh, Warren Brown, is from Lytton. And uh, he was asked by CBC, like, why, why are you working in this community? Why are you um, doing this job when you can go to Vancouver and make you know, twice the money? And he said he does it because he, he wants his friends and family to have clean drinking water safe drinking water. So, so Warren's a hero, right? All these operators that we have working for us. I didn't hear once during the pandemic about the frontline water operators that are uh, keeping our facilities running. So, so 
Yeah, it's um, selfless, a selfless kind of job, but really important. And some of our students realize that, and they want to be a part of it, too. So I think I'm running a little bit long on time here. I'm good? Okay. I've got um, <laughs> about maybe about five minutes talking about some of the issues about the, um, the process of setting up a water treatment plant in a First Nation community. So we'll talk about that. And then I've got a video from the founder who's going to take you through what water movement's doing, how is it set up, and what they're hoping to do, which is about seven minutes. So I'm like maybe ten. So life cycle of a project. So any one in project management or setting up a business, very similar thing. Um, so I'll talk about the, the basics of the steps and then show you where some of the breakdowns are. So the planning stage is probably the, the biggest piece of it. They need to basically put together that, um, that plan, infrastructure plan, submit it to Indigenous Services Canada and try and get the funding for it. If it is funded, then they have to do the tender process, you know, for putting out for, for bids to do the building. And then uh, that firm will develop the plans to build it. And that's kind of the planning stage. Then they build it. And then once it's done, they hand it off to the, to the, to the First Nation to manage that, uh, that plant. So which do you think is the worst breakdown um, which stage is, is of the process is uh, the main cause of drinking water advisories? <laughs> I hear some different things. <laughs> but yeah, people are calling out. I'm, I'm hearing like two or three of the different stages and you're all right. Um, basically, uh, any process has, has, um, has issues. Yeah, so each of the stages adds their own fuel to the fire. So, um, in the planning stage, um, the, the tendering process, I know it's always seemed a little bit weird to me that you know the lowest bidder always gets the contract. <laughs> like, is that really the the way you want to operate when you've got you know a, a sector in crisis? Um, and then also, often the lowest bidder will have a design, just a typical water pollution control plant or, or drinking water plant, and that cookie cutter model may not fit. There might be specific um, issues. It's pretty remote. So into the next stage, um, when you're designing it and building it, are they considering some of those local issues? Are they doing their due diligence by being up there in that community several times to see what's actually going on specifically and how that design needs to be adapted for, for where they are in their conditions? Um, then there's the handover. There you go, here are the keys, right? But thinking about, okay, are they spending enough time with them? Like, are they handing over the operational and service manuals? Are they looking at, you know, what are the equi equipment uh, timelines? Where are the failure points? You know, do you know how to operate it based on its design and its intent? So that's, um, that's an issue um, as well. And operations, um, learning on the job, <laughs> one heck of a learning curve. Um, but that's kind of the biggest thing. But when you're, you're one operator, how do you go away for training? Who's going to do your job while you go away for training, right? So that's even a challenge. So really being mentored by, by senior operators on the job, that's where we have success. And unfortunately, it's not very common. So we need more training. We need more collaboration. And that's where water movement steps in. So this was a, another slide a bit earlier um, showing you some of the short term advisories as well, uh, shorter term. So yeah, they're, they're spread across Canada. There's even one in southwestern Ontario. So o Oneida Nation of the Thames, um, Thames River is um, also under a long-term boil water advisory. So it's not just northern communities too. So each of them, if you go on the government website, each of them actually has like what step of the plan, what step of the process are they in to remove the advisory. So it's great that we're working on this but hopefully we'll get here <laughs> soon. And um, I'm going to uh, queue up a bit to tell you more about water movement and what they're doing to help uh, work on this crisis. So I'm going to tap on the screen and I might need to do something fancy, but fingers crossed. 
Okay, I don't have volume. Through with water movement, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be speaking with you today. Water Movement is a nonprofit organization. We are a proud and hardworking group of university students and industry professionals making strides to tackle United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 6, Clean Water and Sanitation. In this presentation, we will go over how Water Movement was formed and the resources it's providing to frontline heroes working to provide clean water to their communities. The Water Movement platform was developed after spending three years connecting with, listening to, and learning from Indigenous water treatment operators who are working tirelessly to provide their communities with safe, clean drinking water. We already knew that 80% of water advisories stem from equipment and processes failing, but we wanted to understand why this failure is happening and the underlying cause. The stakeholders we met were able to provide insight. The list of reasons we heard from them, well, as you might have guessed, it goes on and on. But regardless of who we heard from, the common challenges revolved around training and collaboration opportunities, or should I say the lack of. Some operators don't receive formal training. Courses are expensive, not to mention the travel and accommodation to get to them. Some communities just can't afford this within their budget. Time off work is another barrier for operators, especially at smaller facilities. And for those operators who still manage to find success, it's only because they were lucky enough to be trained by senior operators. Operators are wasting so much time troubleshooting when the problem has already been solved elsewhere but they just don't know about it. They just aren't connected to enough other and more experienced professionals. Outside of annual conferences and regional Facebook pages, operators don't have a formal platform to ask questions or share lessons learned. And as you know, every hour is critical when you're a water operator. If you don't fix the issue timely, that's it. You're under a water advisory. So what is one way to solve this? With water movement. Water movement provides the resources to improve, optimize, and sustain equipment and processes. The water movement platform allows operators to watch videos about maintenance procedures, troubleshooting techniques, and even allows them to connect with their peers and experts to ask questions. Let's take a look at this in action. Take Fred, for example. His facility's pump won't start, his senior operator is sick, the maintenance manual is 40 pages, and if he doesn't fix the problem soon, his community could lose water. Now let's imagine Fred with water movement. He accesses the water movement platform where a step-by-step -step video guides him on how to troubleshoot. He finds that with a quick breaker switch, his pump is running again. Let's take a look. When you run into a problem like a pump won't start or something, sometimes just a simple breaker. So these are my little breakers. And if one of them is tripped, they'll actually be sticking out. And it's just a matter of pushing the breaker in and the system starts running again. Fred asks one of Water Movement's key features, the video learning library troubleshooting techniques, best maintenance practices, and how-to videos by experts help operators like Fred improve their equipment reliability and integrity. Fred could have also tapped into a wider network to ask questions, share lessons learned, and even spotlight anyone who's helped him out. Fred is one of 4,900 users engaging in the Water Movement platform, which launched in January 2021. As we release more videos, we see an average 20% monthly increase in website traffic. It is evident that operators value this transformational knowledge. Success has empowered 12 more experts across the country to partner with us. We spent the summer of 2021 visiting communities and facilities to film content for 100 new videos to be added to the video learning library. The majority of our videos feature Indigenous experts because operators want to see and hear from those who can relate to their struggles. 
We've also expanded our video topics to not only feature videos that support operators, but also students and operators in training. Our videos with Professor Steph have been some of the most popular amongst those looking for extra support in answering common math and chemistry questions. We've also expanded the video library to feature cultural videos to help preserve Indigenous traditions. You can scan this QR code to check out some of the videos today. As the platform grows, we anticipate to have thousands of operators utilize water movement, and not just in Canada, but worldwide. In fact, we've seen users from over 24 countries engage in the platform already. The water movement platform is innovative, unique, and thousands strong in user engagement and community partnership. We are even working with the Ministry of Indigenous Services to further the planning and implementation of this program. We are so thankful to instructor, Steph, and operators in training like Josie who have joined the movement. We are always looking to add new knowledge to our library and we're always open to new volunteers. So if you're interested in helping out, please don't hesitate to reach out. On the screen, you can find our contact info and you can find us across almost all social media channels, even TikTok. Feel free to scan the QR code on the screen to go directly to the Water Movement platform. Thank you so much for listening today. So do we have any questions for Steph? All right, thank you. Oh, no. Yeah, no, I see. Yeah. Um, at the beginning, you talked about initiative for uh, free schooling or free training to get, uh, is there like an active campaign of, or education system to like put in place in the, in the far north communities uh, that this is available or is it just something that gets sent out because I feel like the message would be moot if it's not being delivered to the people who Right. That's a good question. Um, yeah, communication is always key, right? About, you know, we might, there might be greater programs available, but people don't know about them. It's not very, very helpful. Um, yeah, that I found out about those programs. It, it didn't seem really well advertised. Maybe it is more so in First Nation communities, but the Walkerton Clean Water Center was where I found um, that information. And I talked to the uh, director there about how the training's offered and and such. So if you know someone in a First Nation community, I would uh, suggest that they reach out to um, one of the resources, like um, to the, uh, where are we? Well, you could reach out to me to start, but the Ontario, um, the, I mean the Walkerton Clean Water Centre, the helpline that I put up on the screen, um, I can direct you to that too. But basically I think if, if you know someone who does, maybe is not aware of this training, then, then let them know. So you can contact Walkerton Clean Water Center or the Ontario Water and Wastewater Certification Office. I think maybe we'll be sharing some of the content. Yeah, we'll be sharing slide decks and stuff with them, um, with participants. So you should have more information if you, but if not, feel free to reach out. Also uh, a bit uh, like if you had questions specifically about water movement, um, you could send, send uh, her team an email and they'll be sure to, to answer it uh, post summit. Anyone else? All right, you're up though. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, wait. Hey, Corey. Um, I just have a question. Sorry. <laughs> um, since the Walkerton Clean Water Center but the certifications are really based on Ontario regulations. But my understanding is that First Nations fall under federal regulations. So does that mean to work in a First Nations doing their like water quality or distribution or whatever, do they have to be certified under the Ontario Drinking Water Act? 
question. That's, yeah, federal jurisdiction. Because it's generally. federal, it's not yeah. Ontario. Yeah, I'm not really sure the answer to that at this point. But I stumped you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there you go. You got me. But, um, yeah, I just yeah. wondered because, like, my pre kindergarten days, I was a water quality analyst, right? So people would send me their water samples, and I always thought it was different that, you know, I have my Ontario water samples, and there's different, you know, parameters that they had to meet versus the First Nations. So yeah, they have different um, different certification offices in different provinces, mm -hmm. but generally they're pretty transferable within the country. Um, I had a student that wanted to move to New Zealand and. I was kind of <laughs> cool. taking at a loss for uh, how to support that. But um, um, I know that the First Nation communities, they can actually contact the Clean Water Center or yeah. the certification office and get assessed. Some will come up and assess their operation. Yeah. And once they get that level, they can actually use that time as hours towards their certification. Yeah. So there is a, a step in there too to be incorporated, but it seems that they, yeah. they communicate well between jurisdictions. But but they yeah, don't necessarily sure. have to have like their provincial certification, or you don't know? Um, yeah, because I know in Ontario, like not in yeah. federal jurisdiction, yeah, you need to be certified in order right. to work, work in a plant. You need to be an operator in training just to be sweeping yeah. floors in a plant, yeah. right? And so, um, yeah, so that's, that's really important, but I'm not sure if it's required there, but I think that's maybe another reason why they really want to promote it, yeah. because training is so important.